You cannot pretend that this is genuine. You cannot pretend that putting in place a policy you've had for a decade is actually a genuine additional offset. It's a scam. Drop it. You can save these forests with the stroke of a pen. It should be extended from native forest to all critical koala habitat. Just do it now. The public will thank you. The world will thank you. One for mum. One for dad. One for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Treasurer. Don't the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in you know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains economics, politics and policy in plain English. I'm your host, Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. And if you ask an international visitor to pick their favourite Australian animal, there's a pretty good chance they'd say it's the koala. But despite being a national icon, the future of the species is uncertain. Listed as endangered in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT, koalas are being pushed to the brink by habitat destruction and fragmentation, which makes them more vulnerable to predation and disease. The New South Wales Labor government came to power with a long-standing promise to protect a koala habitat by creating a Great Koala National Park. Pitch to save the koala. Labor is vowing to create a Great Koala National Park. Pledging $80 million to assess a new Great Koala National Park. All Chris Minns has announced is a plan to consult on a plan. More than 8,000 hectares of koala habitat on the New South Wales mid-north coast is now off limits to loggers. The big problem is... They're still logging it. Koalas in New South Wales are in a dire state. In just 12 years, they've gone from not being listed at all to being now listed as endangered. Extinct by 2050. We don't need to monetise them, we just need to appreciate them. But the Australia Institute senior fellow and Walkley Award-winning journalist Stephen Long has been investigating why the park is yet to be delivered. The state government is effectively sitting on its hands while it develops a carbon credit scheme. In effect, by doing nothing, the New South Wales state government is allowing forests to be logged and the state's koala population is under even more pressure. Stephen's joining us today. G'day, Stephen. G'day, Ebony. So, Stephen, you've been on a trip up north to look at some of the key forests up there that are koala habitat. What prompted you to make this visit and and what are some of the things that you found there? Well, it was really prompted by that extraordinary statement by Chris Minns, which I thought was very candid in saying, we don't want to create this national park or stop logging until we can make money from the forests. There are many industries, many companies, governments around the world that are desperate for carbon offsets and um, we'll be looking at jurisdictions like New South Wales in relation to that. So I thought I'd better go and have a look at what kind of forests we were talking about, what's in, what's out, and what the implications are of what the government's doing. I had a mate who's writing a book on koalas, Greg Borschman, an ex-ABC journo, and he put me on to a delightful couple, John Pyle and Anne Coyle. They have lived since the early 1980s adjacent to the Pine Creek State Forest, and John just has an amazing affinity with koalas. He's called Koala John. In fact, (laughs) they're both the kind of people who just have animals and birds flock to them and just have an affinity with nature. They live off the grid. Uh, There's no internet at their home. You can't get them on the phone because there's no mobile reception, so they're pretty hard to catch. But when I did catch them, they just proved to be wonderful champions of the forest, but also people who'd been deeply moved by by what they'd seen with logging and the destruction of koala habitat. There was a koala just over from our house walking in a circle in an open paddock and it had been there for two hours walking in a circle. It was so traumatised, a big big male, he was probably the alpha male. It was quite upsetting because Anne and I went over from our place just across the road, across the bridge and there was a mother and Joey in a casuarina in the middle of the clear fell a 50 metre clear fell around it, just looking distressed. 
a female with a joey on her back who was constantly climbing a stump, about a four-foot stump. Some of their descriptions from this um, research video that you've produced are really harrowing when they're kind of talking about the impact of clear felling on koalas. It's pretty confronting stuff. It certainly is. Uh, Those descriptions are just chilling of koalas that have lost their trees and just don't know what to do. Equally chilling was when John took me to an area that had been logged not so long ago by the Forestry Corporation of New South Wales. Now, they reckon, the foresters, that this area was plantation, so it was ripe for clear felling. In fact, I've spoken to ecologists who had looked at the vegetation there. It was highly mixed eucalypt forest with regenerating flooded gum. They said some of it would be classed as native forest. Certainly there's a dispute about whether it was plantation or all of it, and it was a mapped and recognised koala hub. But this is one of the problems because Forestry Corporation asserts its plantation, they can mow it all down the whole lot. And it was a devastating scene that John showed me and described to me. You know, there were animals here, there were koalas here. There would have been a minimum of five home ranging in this whole area. It's a huge area. Did you tell them that there were koalas here? Yeah, I came out on this site where we're standing, pointed out there were koalas and tried to get some areas reserved to link both sides, but not to be. How do you feel when you see this? Well, gutted, you know, it's shocking, you know, like... What are we going to leave our future generations? Even though it's it's state forest and, and there's dispute over how it's described, I mean, that has no impact on it being koala habitat, you know, how it's listed in legislation or, or otherwise. The, the point is it's, it's koala habitat. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem. Because that was classed as plantation, it was open slather for being logged, even though it's koala habitat. Uh, There's other areas that the New South Wales government has safeguarded in advance of proclaiming the National Park that are koala habitat, but none in so-called plantation. And there are also definitely areas of native forest on the mid-north coast that are being logged in the Ellis State Forest near Grafton, on the Dorigo Plateau. You're seeing trees that are well over 100 years old that are being ripped asunder and torn down. So, Stephen, the New South Wales Labor Party made an election commitment to protect habitat through the creation of this Great Koala National Park. What kind of area are we talking about here? And and is this long-standing Labor policy? It's, it's definitely long-standing Labor policy, Ebony. We found documents going back to 2015 where the New South Wales Labor Party publicly committed to creating the Great Koala National Park. They talked about then incorporating 176,000 hectares of state forest with critical koala habitat into existing park to make a 315,000 hectare park on the mid-north coast. Now, the only variation I can find is that occasionally now the minister, Penny Sharp, refers to 175,000 hectares of habitat. So it's essentially the same policy. Very little difference. A commitment to this vast koala sanctuary on the north coast of New South Wales. And so as we kind of talked about in the intro, it was really at a budget estimates hearing that the Premier revealed some of the reasons perhaps why this park hasn't become a reality yet, even though it's a commitment of the government. Tell us about this idea that the forests have to earn carbon credits or or turning these forests into carbon credits. Why is that so important? So officially the government's line is that they're delaying the gazetting of the forest for consultation with stakeholders, loggers, Indigenous people, environmentalists. But they have also now confirmed to us that they are actively considering a carbon credits method as part of the development of the park. You have to have the system up and running before you can quarantine a park or an area to allow for that area or that zone to be eligible for the carbon transfer. Um, If you do it in reverse, then you can't retroactively go to that national park or that forest and say, this will now apply to carbon offsets in the future. Now, 
The difficulty here, Ebony, is that one of the core foundation principles of any carbon credits is that for them to have integrity, they have to provide additional carbon sequestration. They have to, they have to be avoiding emissions that otherwise would have been made. So you can't get them for doing what would have happened anyway. And this is the big difficulty here. When the government's talking about a national park that's been their policy for 10 years, how can we be talking about additional savings, additional uh, ad additional carbon sequestration to what would have happened in the normal course of events. So on that level, it seems to me to be a sham. Now, the chap from the Environment Department who's heading this has told people I've spoken to, oh, no, we've committed to the National Park, but not to its boundaries. That seems disingenuous given this long-standing policy and the kind of area that's been mentioned. And I think that that really goes to the heart of the problem here. And that problem, I guess, being that, you know, it's not additional, as you've said, Labor's already committed to doing this. So in effect, they're dragging their feet on this promise to try and institute this kind of a scheme when we know there's big problems with carbon credits and offsets in any case. Indeed, indeed. I mean, how problematic is this approach from the government? Well, they want to get paid for putting in place existing policy. That's the first problem. The second problem is that how do you actually establish what area would have genuinely been under threat? The logging industry in New South Wales is loss-making. The social licence for logging is rapidly declining. So how do you establish what a genuine level of threat, what the baseline was here? Now, you have to have a baseline when you're dealing with carbon credits, and it's often a murky thing working out what it would be. And if you overstate it, you're rewarding people with offsets that are fake. You know, there was no genuine threat, then the offsets are fake. And remember, these can be sold to businesses that can use the carbon credits as an offset to allow them to maintain or even expand their carbon emissions. So if these carbon credits aren't genuine, then we're actually making the problem worse. And the terrible irony here is that this will be contributing to the climate change, which is a primary threat to the forests in question and to the survival of the koalas. And, you know, probably the major extinction threat that the koalas face on top of logging and land clearing now is global warming. And this could make this worse. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a problem we've seen time and time again with carbon credits and, and offsets, I guess. And Ultimately, Stephen, it comes back to this again that we've talked about um, so regularly through the Australia Institute's research is effectively the New South Wales government is trying to design this really complex market mechanism when actually it's quite simple and straightforward. Just make the national park the way you said you would and end native forest logging. That's actually really straightforward. I mean, WA and Victoria have already done it without carbon offsets and credits. It's really adding this whole layer of complexity that's not required. It certainly is, and it's all about the money. In the end, they want to make money from it in New South Wales. And it is also, as you kind of alluded to, Ebony, about the embrace of a neoliberal ideology, a theory that we have to have markets, we have to turn this stuff into markets. We don't need to. We don't need to monetise the forests. We don't need to commodify the carbon. We just need to recognise the intrinsic value of those forests as koala habitat, as habitat for endangered species, as places of recreation and places that are providing us with clean water. If we didn't do this, we've already got a massive problem emerging up on the north coast with growing population and water supply. If we, if we don't do this, there are going to be so many problems created. There's intrinsic value here that's worth saving on its own. And it could be done with the stroke of a pen. One of the problems too, Ebony, is though that the Environment Department has embraced this carbon credits method. It's pushing and trying to get up, partly because it's seen as the lesser of two evils, because the New South Wales Forestry Corporation, a loss-making government venture, and the broader forestry industry are pushing their own version of carbon credits, which would see them get 
paid money in the form of carbon credits just for, say, extending the rotation of logging or not turning everything into wood chips or pulp and saving some of the trees for timber which might go into long life timber products basically for doing the kind of stuff that we should be expecting anyway as good practice uh, they want to get paid money and that money could actually subsidize the continuation of native forest logging in an otherwise loss-making industry. And carbon offsets and credits aren't the only place where we've seen integrity problems. I know New South Wales has a biodiversity offset scheme that's been heavily criticised and has problems with integrity as well. But Stephen, I did want to ask you about um, the Australia Institute's open letter. So we have coordinated for over a 100 activists, academics, business people and prominent Australians to sign an open letter to Premier Chris Minns asking to end logging in public native forests and koala habitat to gazette this great koala national park. But this is a big issue in New South Wales and the pressure on the government is it's building, isn't it? It certainly is building and hopefully we can convince the New South Wales government that try to make a little bit of money out of carbon credits isn't worth it, especially when you have such prominent citizens raising the alarm, belling the cat, that the carbon credits would lack integrity. And the lack of morality in allowing native forest logging to continue and critical koala habitat to be destroyed whilst you pursue this folly is certainly something that is now coming to the public's attention. Hopefully it will cause a bit of a rethink by the New South Wales government. And who's the New South Wales government speaking to at the moment? Am I correct in thinking they recently had a bit of a, a closed-door meeting about this? They had a meeting about drafting a new policy for saving koalas. It was called a koala summit held at Taronga Park Zoo. We weren't invited but I managed to gate crash Ebony. <laughs> I, I went along. And what was interesting there was the entire body of people supported the idea that we should, with haste, gazette the Great Koala National Park. And people I spoke to were aghast at the idea this was being delayed whilst they tried to make money out of the forest through carbon credits. But that elephant in the room, the fact that that the park has been delayed whilst the government tries to make money by generating a carbon credits method that would be registered with the clean energy regulator wasn't mentioned. It actually wasn't mentioned in proceedings. The, the minister gave a speech. We had keynote speech from an ecological expert. We had lots and lots of talk, but no one mentioned the carbon credits issue. The government's been trying to keep this on the back burner, keep it stumm, despite the fact that the premier let the cat out the bag. But now this has to be something that's debated publicly. The integrity of it, which is completely lacking, and the wisdom of doing this when we could be stopping the destruction of the koala habitat right now and just, just finish it like other states have. Carbon stored in these trees is sold as credits to the government and organisations wanting to compensate or offset their pollution. There is a proliferation of fraudulent carbon credits circulating in these rapidly growing markets. The risk is that carbon markets are actually driving the catastrophic climate change that we're seeing now. I want to jump from the state level to the federal level here because carbon credits and offsets are actually a really big part of the federal government's climate change strategy. But this case, I guess, really shows how they can create quite perverse incentives where, as you say, it could be merely funding extra logging of, of native forests in the end. This is clearly an issue that needs to be addressed at the federal level as well. It's funny you should mention that because this is actually boiling away behind the scenes in terms of a federal native forests strategy, which is being worked on. And my understanding is that carbon credits are in the mix for that as well. So this is, this is actually growing like a virus, the whole carbon credits push. And I fear that if New South Wales gets away with this, it'll set a dangerous precedent where people will say, I mean, you think about it, Ebony, why would a government just declare a national park from now on 
if you could hold off and say, oh, we're not going to declare it until we can make money from carbon credits. And then you're creating out of National Park a license for others to do further climate pollution. I mean, it's crazy stuff. But as this neoliberal philosophy that everything has to become a market, a market for offsets, biodiversity offsets, carbon credits, carbon offsets, as we turn the environment into another market, commodify the environment, uh, this is just taking off. So um, I think it'd be great if we could draw a line in the sand here. If not, I fear that we'll have a battle at the federal level as well. Yeah. And as we've discussed before, I mean, it does come back to that really simple argument that ending native forest logging is is what needs to happen and that adding this layer of complexity and this market-driven approach to it is just incredibly problematic um, when actually the issue is quite simple and straightforward in the end. I mean, take us back to those forests in, in New South Wales um, that you visited. What was it like being on the ground up there? Well, what really strikes you when you get up there is how important this habitat is. You go into the forest and you're immediately cool. Whilst we're up there, it was a heat wave. It was 45 degrees. We went into the forest and, you know, it was still hot, but you'd see a 10 degree drop. That alone tells you one of the values you're looking at here. This is actually one of the most biodiverse regions left in Australia, if not the world. And the idea that we're trying to hedge our bets, trying to make money from the forest in some other way than logging, when it's there ripe to be saved with a stroke of a pen just seems really silly. Now, I accept there are jobs a limited number. I've always been someone who's supported workers' rights, but we've had lots of industries, Ebony, where we've had a just transition where people have been given training for new jobs and generous redundancy payments. And there's no reason we couldn't have a small logging industry continue while safeguarding park. And there's no reason we couldn't create other good jobs for workers who are displaced. But the fact is that saving the forest is more important, both for the long-term survival of the planet and for the survival of habitat, than jobs, which could be replaced by other jobs. The New South Wales government promised a great koala national park. But is the government dragging its feet so it can protect the area later to use those trees as carbon credits. That's what the Australia Institute reckons. And Some 100 public figures have penned a letter calling on the New South Wales government to do more. Let's find out who's putting their name to this and what they want to see. Stephen Long is a senior fellow and contributing editor at the Australia Institute. In touch stage left, Stephen Long. Senior Fellow at the Australian Institute. So, Stephen, something that was raised at the recent Australia Institute Climate Integrity Summit is just whether or not um, any forests or, or land turned into carbon credits are really permanent and genuine abatement, if, if we're accepting that they're, you know, um, carbon credits with integrity. Because what happens, you know, when there's a bushfire, for example? So... How certain is this kind of complex market mechanism in terms of burying carbon emissions or being a carbon sink for the long term? Well, that hits the nail on the head. It's not a very good method for offsetting carbon emissions because forests can die and burn, and they do, and carbon emissions have a long tail. We've seen the terrible bushfires on the north coast and mid-north coast of New South Wales and the south coast that destroyed habitat. So you could have a situation where you sell offsets from these forests. The trees die in hundreds of years, and in an even shorter period, you get fire ravage the forests. And yet, we have carbon emissions that are made on the basis of the offsets that will still be in the atmosphere in thousands of years, up to 20% of those emissions, perhaps in 10,000 years, according to the climate science. So you've got a mismatch from relatively short-term sequestration through these forests in, in the scheme of, of uh, environmental history and climate climate change against emissions that will last thousands of years. So even if the integrity of the 
carbon credits could be presumed, and it definitely can't in this case, they're still not going to work as genuine offsets for emissions. We're still going to be producing emissions that damage the climate that aren't genuinely offset because that because of that forest's mismatch. So it doesn't make sense anyway. And it's going to make climate change worse on, on by that account. <laughs> it will make climate change worse. And Stephen, if you had one message for the New South Wales government today, what would it be? You cannot pretend that this is genuine. You cannot pretend that putting in place a policy you've had for a decade is actually a genuine additional offset. It's a scam. Drop it. You can save these forests with the stroke of a pen. It should be extended from native forest to all critical koala habitat. Just do it now. The public will thank you. The world will thank you. And the koalas. <laughs> the koalas won't know, but, but my God, we'll appreciate it on their behalf. Thanks so much, Stephen. If you want to sign our open letter calling on the New South Wales government to stop logging in native forests and protect koala habitat, you can follow the link in the episode description or visit australiainstitute.org.au. This episode was recorded on Tuesday the 9th of April 2024 and things may have changed since recording. In 2024, the Australia Institute is celebrating its 30th anniversary as Australia's leading think tank. If you enjoy Follow the Money and the Australia Institute's research, please consider becoming a regular giver from as little as $10 a month at our website. We would love to hear your thoughts on the show today. You can reach out to us via email at podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au or you can find us on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Our producer is Jennifer Macy with additional editing by Emily Perkins. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ebony Bennett. Thanks for listening. Listening.